All right. Hello and welcome everybody to Cultivating, Learning, Engaging Young Learners with Portraiture. We are all so excited to be here with you today for this session. Um, today we're going to be exploring using portraiture, movement, and art making to engage young learners with art, history, and more. Um, we're going to be doing a few different things together during this 30-minute session. Um, to start off with, my colleague and I are going to give a quick introduction and go through some general logistics, and then we're going to hand it over to the exciting part where our uh, guest presenters are going to be walking us through some transferable techniques and activities um, that you can bring into your own classroom, whether that's taking place in person or online. And then at the end, we'll open it up to a larger discussion. We'd love to hear any questions you have. We want to make sure that this session is as, is as helpful for you as it can be. So we'd like to introduce the, the people who are presenting today. My name's Philippa Rappaport, and my colleague Tess Porter and I work at the Smithsonian Center for Learning and Digital Access, which is the office behind the Smithsonian Learning Lab. We're joined today with our awesome guests, Beth Evans and Irina Rubenstein, who are educators at the National Portrait Gallery. This is the first in our series that we're calling Cultivating Learning. And in this series, we'll feature educators as they model teaching techniques for using digital museum resources to support student learning in diverse learning environments. So this is part of a set of webinars that we have here at the Learning Lab that explore how to use digital museum resources to support learning. Um, we've just finished outlining our April webinar schedule. We'll be adding it to our Help Center shortly. Um, so you'll see, you know, if you want to learn more about getting started with using digital museum resources, creating collections, perhaps you want to drop into our online office hours where we answer questions about really anything related to the Learning Lab. The schedule for April is here on the screen. We'll also be adding links to all of those sessions on our Help Center later this week. You'll see the URL there on the screen. The session today will be archived. So if you want to watch it again, share it with a friend, you can find it at the URL you're watching the session at now. We'll also be adding the archive link on the Help Center um, after this session airs. So you can watch it again there as well. The Learning Lab is a free online platform where you can discover digital museum resources from across the Smithsonian and beyond. You can create interactive learning experience with them, and then you can share your discoveries and creations with others. So we'll be sharing a few resources on the Learning Lab today from the National Portrait Gallery. You can find links to the lab and to those resources in the description of this video. And we'll also put those links into the chat as we, as we get to each of the resources. If you'd like to learn more about using the Learning Lab, whether it's learning how to search for resources or build interactive learning experiences, collections of your own, you can also do that at the Help Center I mentioned earlier. Uh, the URL is here again on the screen. In the Help Center, alongside links to all of our upcoming and archived sessions, you can also find step-by-step -step instructions on how to do essentially everything on the Learning Lab. So this is an interactive session, which means we would love to hear from you. So please do post your questions. If you're joining us today on YouTube, you can post your question through the chat function on the right-hand side. And if you're joining us today from Facebook, you can put them in the comments section at the bottom of your screen. So to get us started, we have a couple questions. Um, so I'd love to turn it over to Beth and Irina to get us started and talk more about these questions. Yeah, so we have two different questions here. Um, the first question is, how do you interact with portraiture in your daily life? So take a second, think about that. We would love to hear how you interact with portraiture in your daily life in the chat. Um, 
but while you're typing, I'll tell you how I interact with portraiture. Um, of course, I work at the portrait gallery, so I get to interact with portraiture all the time. But one of the ways I interact with it in my daily life, now that a lot of my world is virtual, is through my phone camera. It's become a way of staying in touch with friends and family um, who I don't live with. Um, so my my camera on my phone is definitely a huge aspect and a huge way that I interact with portraiture, um, seeing the smiling faces of my friends and family. Oh, Beth, I think your mic is muted. <laughs> I think you're right. While you're thinking about Irina's question, I'll go ahead and read the second question. How do young learners interact with portraiture? Young people, um, the same as the rest of us are surrounded by images of people. They're surrounded um, in their media, in books, in videos, in advertisements. And it's so important to engage them with that, to get their visual literacy up, have them thinking about questions like, how is this person portrayed and why? And what is this, what message is this person communicating through their image? Um, and I think through these programs for young learners in which we look at faces of people from history, faces of people today, uh, we build up that visual literacy to get kids more engaged with the world around them. Yeah, I'll just share some thoughts I had in response to these questions while we wait for answers to come in. So I think similar to what Irina said, when I think about interacting with portraiture in my daily life, it's really off of my phone. I'm thinking about Instagram and seeing pictures of friends, of family, of people I don't know, and you know, looking at the ways that they present themselves online. And with the I, thinking about how young learners interact with portraiture, I can imagine that they'll grow up interacting with portraits in similar ways. And so it's not only, you know, thinking about the techniques that we're going to be diving into today, it's not only a really helpful technique in engaging with art and history, but it will hopefully also help them engage and look more closely at the portraiture that they encounter in their everyday lives. Yeah, and I loved Ashley's comments in the chat um, about uh, taking selfies and framed photos and also the commemorative stamps to send handwritten letters. Um, love the idea of kind of sending a portrait of someone you might admire to um, a friend or family member with a letter. That's great. Well, thank you so much, folks, for sending uh, your ideas in the chat. If you are still working on your idea, feel free to continue uh, typing it and sending it whenever you're ready. So Irina and Beth, uh, should we get started with talking about the transferable techniques you're here to share? Yeah, let's dive in. So Young Portrait Explorers is the program that we're going to be highlighting today. It's a portrait gallery program that has existed for many years. We've developed a very loyal local following of families uh, who've been joining us in this monthly program for years. When everything uh, went virtual, we transitioned Young Portrait Explorers to Instagram, um, and we found that we were still getting a great following, but since Instagram is uh, a grown-up platform, we were getting a lot of um, adults interacting and, and we wanted to get back to our roots of working with young learners and so we as of January of this year have been able to transition young portrait explorers back to uh, working with uh, pre-k and up and um, really all ages of children engaging them with portraiture and through these different iterations of the program we've been we've followed the same components of expanding the canon, meaning that we want to expose children to different stories, different narratives, different faces than what they might not have heard or, or learned about yet. Um, we always have three elements in the program. We look closely at art. We have movement because that's how we learn and that's especially how young people learn. Um, also, the movement, I think, helps because screen time is hard on all of us. It's hard on parents. It's hard on the young people. So when we incorporate the movement, 
it it helps us um, I think feel better about the fact that we're we're encouraging families to do one more thirty minute program of screen time, and then we have a, a creative activity where we're making art and we're trying something new. Thank you, Beth. Yeah, it's a really and helpful anyone, background. If anyone has any questions about these components, um, I'm happy to answer. But um, all the programs that Irene and I do for Young Portrait, portrait Explorers, they all fall into this, um, this rubric. Yeah, so now we'd love to share um, our PowerPoint that we use for this program. Um, and Beth and I are going to take you through this PowerPoint that we use. And along the way, we're going to model two different activities for you. So to start, um, when young learners and their adults sign onto the program, we greet them and we go over some reminders. Um, and then we begin um, by talking to them about the National Portrait Gallery, what it looks like and where this program might take place if we were in the galleries. Then we go over what a portrait is. We use a selection of portraits from our collection to help learners identify key aspects of portraiture. And then we move on to the sitter that we're focusing on for that program. And today the sitter we're focusing on is Celia Cruz. And this is the first activity that we're going to model for you. And it's called jumping in. In this activity, we ask participants to pretend to jump into the portrait. Once participants are in the portrait, we use our five senses to explore the artwork. So now I would like to ask all of you to put on your student hats and jump into this portrait of Celia Cruz. And for the sake of time today, I'm just going to ask about two of the five senses. So on the count of three, we're going to pretend to jump into this portrait. And as you're jumping in, you can become whatever size you like, bigger, smaller, or you can stay the same and you can land anywhere in the portrait that you'd like. So, are you ready? One, two, three. Great. Has everyone landed in the portrait? All right. So, from where you have landed, take a look around, and I'd like for you to first use your sight and tell me, what do you see in this portrait? And feel free to add your observations into the chat. And I would also love to ask my colleagues while you're typing, what do they see? What do you see in the portrait? Felpa, do you want to go first? Sure. I see palm trees, lots of green. I see some water in the background there. Yes, so Philpa is noticing the setting of this portrait. Um, the palm trees are definitely a big part of this portrait. Um, and the waterway um, right right um, underneath the palm trees. Yes, and I see um, someone has noticed the blue sky. Definitely that bright blue sky in the portrait. Um, Tess, what else? What do you see? So I chose to jump into the portrait right here. I think I'm pretty small because I was really interested by her dress. Um, I really wanted to get a closer look at what she is wearing. I love the ruffles here. I see some lace. And I saw someone else in the chat was also noticing a beautiful yellow dress. Yeah, the yellow dress definitely stands out, right? Um, and Tess, I love the way that you pointed out some details of the dress, um, the ruffles and the lace. Um, it gives you a nice visual of, um, of this portrait and specifically about what our sitter is wearing. Um, and we like, to, we like to use our sight um, in, in this jumping in activity. Um, so we can really pay attention to those details, but also so we can get a larger sense of the portrait itself and even some simple observations. Maybe you're noticing something that um, your friend might not. So those are definitely important. 
Um, Speaking of other observations that um, people are noticing that you might have not, I'm looking at the chat and I'm seeing Ashley is noticing a shadow behind Celia Cruz. So for me, that's giving a sense of what the lighting is like, maybe the weather. That's making me think about other senses. And then I see Dale is noticing her pose, how her arms are raised up. Yeah, those are really those are really um, great observations. And Tess, as you mentioned, these observations also might fall into other senses and other categories. And we really encourage that. Um, bringing together our senses can really help us uh, create a fuller picture of um, Celia Cruz and who she is. So we love all of these observations coming in. Yes, L. Caldwell says Celia. Uh, Celia Cruz's arm stretched out, her mouth is open, is she singing? Yes, that is a great observation. I know the portrait is kind of small on this screen. Um, there, thank you, Tess. But yes, her mouth is open, that is a great observation. She is in fact singing. So I just wanna ask about one more sense, and this is the sense of touch. Um, some people have noticed the dress and the palm trees. If you were able to feel some of these objects or things in the portrait, what might they feel like? So Tess or Philippa, I'll ask you first while everyone is answering in the chat. I, for me, this is actually the strongest sense of it. When you say to jump in is I feel that breeze coming off of mm -hmm. the palm trees. Oh, I yeah. love that. It's just reminding me too of thinking about uh, the other senses that I was thinking about, you know, thinking about, I was talking about the sun earlier that um, I was thinking about based off of Ashley's observation. It's making me think about the warmth of the scene too. I'm really excited for having green grass again, living in a place that is just starting to have that again right now. Yeah, yeah, I love, I love the sense of feel and touch that um, you are bringing in. Um, it's really nice to kind of work your imagination and pretend that you're in this portrait. Um, and as you said, Philippa and Tess, like the sun and the air, you can imagine what the climate is like. Maybe our visual clues might help us, um, but really to kind of imagine um, how it might feel to be in this portrait is also it's also great. So I love I love those answers. Um, Rock the Rockwell Museum is no, is saying the softness in the lace, very drapey and soft. Yeah, um, there is definitely a soft quality about that dress, um, and you might even you might even imagine how it might feel to wear the dress. Um, so I love I love that observation. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, um, great job, everyone. I loved how everyone used their sense of sight and touch and your imagination to explore this portrait. And of course, our senses of smell and hearing and taste are just as important when jumping into a portrait. But for the sake of time, we are now going to jump out of the portrait on the count of three. One, two, three. Great. So everyone can now take off their student hats. Um, and I'd love for you to take a second and in the chat, let me know um, what, how you thought this activity went or one thing that you learned or were surprised to hear. And as you're writing, um, I'll just say that we use this jumping in activity as a strategy and a way to bring out um, observations, explore the artwork and get young learners to think about a 2D portrait in a different and more interactive manner. So after the jumping in activity concludes, but while observations are still fresh in the minds of young learners, we use this opportunity to tell participants a little bit about Celia Cruz and maybe answer some questions that came out of the activity. And one of the ways that uh, we choose to share Celia Cruz's biography is by looking at a map and showing young learners Celia Cruz's migration from Cuba, where she was born, to the United States, where she became the queen of salsa. 
Um, next, we go over some vocab words. Uh, for this program, we chose three words that were important to the context of the program. The first word that you see on your screen is azúcar, uh, which is the Spanish word for sugar, but also a word that Celia Cruz popularized by exclaiming it at the end of almost every salsa song that she sang. And we used uh, Celia Cruz's pose in the portrait with her arms stretched out to help us imagine what she might look like as, as she exclaims, azúcar. Um, and so the other two vocab words in this program are salsa, and we play a video to show Celia Cruz dancing salsa and Afro-Latina. Okay, then the next portion of our program is the movement and we the movement with Celia Cruz is learning to sing and dance along to one of her songs. So we start by doing a call and repeat with a, a portion of her song called Kimbara. Um, the educator will say a few lines and the participants go back and forth. And then when this is over, we jump to a video um, from Sesame Street in which Celia Cruz sings this song and teaches it to um, some children in Sesame Street and then they dance along. And uh, it's a, a really fun video. It's super energetic and it, it's a great way to introduce kids uh, to the work of Celia Cruz. They can hear that iconic voice of Celia Cruz and also get them, um, you know, shake off the cobwebs, get them dancing, um, have them dance to salsa music. And uh, it's a really, really fun activity. And we want this program to be fun for kids. But once we've done that, we've gotten our wiggles out, then we go back to the portrait and we talk a little bit about close looking at this portrait. And um, we talk about how one way to engage with a portrait is to jump in. And another way to engage with it is to sketch it. And we, we do a sketching exercise with the kids. Um, one of our, our sort of something that stressed us out a little bit, I think, in initially converting Young Portrait Explorers from an in-museum program to an at-home program, was we had an education center full of different art materials and supplies that we could pull from. And we were always trying to in, expose kids to new materials and new techniques. And at home, we had to really, really scale things back. And so we worried that it would not be as engaging for kids. And we found that that's not the case, that it's um, the prompt can be just as important as the materials that they use. And especially sketching has been incredibly helpful with the kids to get them to look closely and, um, and really slow down and take in what they're seeing because then they have to recreate it. So we start by just looking at um, the portrait. And I'll show you here that we start with a few simple lines. We'll talk about the side, the shape of her head, which is a circle, and I'll, we'll ask, is her head in the top, the middle, or the bottom of the page? And it's pretty much in the top. So when we draw a circle, um, sort of like that, and then with just a few simple lines, we, we show the kids that if you can draw some lines, you can draw Celia Cruz. We start off like that, and then if you want to get even more detailed, you can draw her dress, you can draw her, her, eyes, her eyes are closed, her mouth is open, you can draw her hair. Basically we go through how with just a few simple lines to draw her head and body, how to draw the background behind her. Um, and then it comes out, this is sort of a, a halfway through in progress sketch that we do with the kids. And then we turn on some music, um, some Sylvia Cruz music and let them sketch out the portrait. We keep the, the picture up. Oh, there it is. We keep the picture up um, and give them time to focus on what they're seeing and then to recreate it on their own. I have some uh, examples that a few young learners that live at my house have done. These are by my four-year-olds. Um, and my daughter was so proud of hers that she had to actually sign her name because she wanted everyone to know that this was her creation. And sketching is an incredibly helpful way for learners of all ages to engage with portraiture. Here, um, 
another really lovely part about doing these at home has been the emails that we've gotten from participants and from um, grown-ups of how much they enjoyed it. And they, they send us photos sometimes. And so we got permission from this parent to, um, to show you these images of, here we can see the progression of the youngest child, um, the older child, and then the parent all recreated the Celia Cruz portrait um, side by side. And that has, that's been a, a really lovely part of young portrait explorers in general, whether it's in the museum or at home as we encourage um, young and old to participate together. We, we try and make these programs empowering for grownups to feel like they can take part in the teaching as well. Um, so a question for all of you is um, a benefit of, of sketching. Why do you think that the simple act of sketching might be so helpful in the museum program, um, especially for young learners who are still getting used to um, to lines and shapes. Thank you so much, Beth and Irina. I, I was just typing that question into the chat for uh, folks to see as well. So how do you think the act of sketching helps learners engage with portraits in a museum environment? Um, something that it was, I mean, and I wanted to circle back to, to, to the question that you raised earlier in the presentation of, you know, putting our teacher hats back on and reflecting the, the activity that we did together with things that you noticed or surprised you about that. I saw a comment in the chat that Ashley said that she likes that this exercise helps learners build on each other's ideas and provides wait time for noticing details that they might not have initially observed. I think that's a great observation and connects to something that I noticed is that it really gave an opportunity uh, to build off of yeah, others' perspectives, there are always going to be things that others notice that an individual learner doesn't. I experienced that myself as an adult taking part in that activity. I see too in the chat that it shows the beautifulness of a picture. It's a way to comprehend the image and find nuances. I really appreciated too how not only that activity and then coming through to the sketching, it's also giving observations to engage with the portrait with multiple senses physically. So using movement, using my voice, using my ability to draw, it's giving multiple touch points. And that seems like it could be really helpful for a variety of learners, giving multiple entry points to engage with an artwork. Philippa, did you have something you wanted to chime in with? I've been thinking along the lines of what you just said, Tess, is that, um, so this is this is pitched for younger learners, right? But if you're really looking at the chat, we are not younger learners in the chat and we are all feeling this, you know? <laughs> we're feeling, I think Dale said heaven and I, you know, and we're feeling the grass and the breeze and the water and I wonder if you can comment about that, about this idea of the senses and how we can use museum content, you know, for all ages by somehow appealing through the senses. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, no, I think, Philippa, you have a great point. Um, Maybe some people, when they walk into the portrait gallery, it's kind of these 2D images in front of them. Although we do have some amazing sculpture and um, time-based media, um, but it can maybe ha be harder for younger learners to really engage in the stories of the sitters on the wall. Um, so I think things like jumping in or drawing can, can help to pull out these observations and the biography of the sitter. Uh, we call it reading the portraits. Um, and those different activities can can help illuminate um, the stories of the sitters on the wall. We have a few more. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Beth. Oh, you're fine. I would just add that there's not a single activity that we do with young learners that wouldn't um, be great for learners of all ages. Uh, it sounds trite, but I think the difference is that young learners are more willing to go with us on this journey. Like when we say jump in, they're like, oh, yes. But if we say jump into grownups, uh, they kind of look around like, 
are you serious right now? Um, but yeah, it's it, for anyone to experience something with all your senses and to imagine yourself there. It's really, um, it, it transports you and it's such a lovely way to, to enjoy art. Thank you. Here, we can point out a few more comments that have come in the chat. Um, we have a comment, it gives children a chance to become artists. Uh, sketching allows for additional interpretations of the portrait, bringing our own perspectives forward. Yeah, absolutely. At the end of the sketching activity, um, at the end of all Young Portrait Explorers, whether we're in the museum or whether we're virtual, everyone has a chance to share out. Um, when we're in the museum, there's a special chair that the children sit on, and it's such a proud moment for them to show their art. And to, they get a chance to show their art and explain some of the choices that they made. Um, when we do the program virtually, they just kind of hold it up and they can they can talk a little bit if they want to. But really, it's just a screen full of kids holding up their their creations. And you know, if we have twenty screens, there's twenty different interpretations of it, and and they're all lovely. So I think that's absolutely valid. I just wanted to take this moment to open it up to a larger discussion, unless there are any other pieces, Beth and Irena, that you wanted to touch on. This feels like a really good point to maybe open it up to larger questions that people in the audience have about using these techniques that we talked about, using portraiture, using movement, using art making to help students engage with portraiture. We have two fantastic experts here with us today. Um, so if you have any questions, uh, those of you in the audience, please feel free to enter them in the chat. And while we're waiting for questions to come in, I'll put a few um, links in the chat of more online content available from the National Portrait Gallery. Yeah, perhaps that's something that we could uh, talk about here with some screen sharing too. I think I have some of these uh, resources open. I wanted to highlight first though, we got a comment asking to do another jump in in the chat. <laughs> um, I love it, Dale. But now you know how to do it. So you can do that with any anything yourself. You can make that a habit of just jumping into what you see. Yeah, and I think some of the resources that we have to share while we wait for questions to come in could be really good starting points for that. Um, so the National Portrait Gallery has so many really great resources available online to dive more deeply into portraiture. Um, so the first link that uh, was shared in the chat is a link to the National Portrait Gallery profile page on the Smithsonian Learning Lab, um, where here you can find tons of resources and collections that educators at the Portrait Gallery have designed uh, to help students use portraiture in a variety of different learning environments. And in particular, we wanted to highlight the um, two collections here that might be helpful to you. The Introducing Collection is the first one of these. Uh, Beth or Irina, do you wanna talk a little bit more about this? And then I see we already have two questions in the chat, so we should probably take a moment to go back to those before moving ahead with these resources. It's hard in these environments to figure out. Who should, <laughs> who should go first? Go for it. Introducing quickly is a, a five, 10 minute story time that we do where instead of reading a book, we look at a portrait and sort of walk through a few terms that we learned through this portrait and who the person is, what their portrait tells us and how this person changed history. Perfect, thank you so much, Beth. And so, you know, we've been plugging links in the chat. You may have noticed too in the description of this session, there are links to everything we've shared today and everything we haven't had time to share. So you'll find a link to this Learning Lab collection. You'll also find a link to an example of the Young Portrait Explorers Learning Lab collection series where they have picked uh, uh, portraits to dive into in particular. They gather uh, questions to help students engage, additional resources to learn more. Um, they're really wonderful collections and art creation activities too. Um, that link is also there in the description and that's another thing you'll find on the National Portrait Gallery group page. But I'd love to turn to one of the uh, questions here in the chat. 
go through them in order. The first question is, do you have any tips for selecting an especially engaging portrait to use with young learners? Um, I think, I think uh, uh, any portrait can be engaging. It's just how you go about it. Um, but maybe some tips if you if you're really looking for that portrait that young learner might like um, is colorful or um, like motions. Like Celia Cruz has her hand up. That's interesting. Some interesting aspect about it, like the setting, the pose, the clothing. Um, Celia Cruz has all of that going for her. Um, but I think using the strategies that we use in this program, you can really make any um, any portrait engaging, or at least that's what I'd like to think. Thank you so much, Irina. Um, we have another question here from Elle. Elle says, would you make a distinction with young learners about a photo portrait versus a painting? Yeah, actually, um, <clears throat> comparing and contrasting two different portraits, often um, maybe by the same person, by two different artists, or the same sitter, but one photograph, one uh, painting, or one uh, print, and one sculpture is a great way to talk with kids about portraiture and also to talk with them about how when we're looking at a portrait, we're not just thinking about what the person in the portrait is trying to convey, but the artist makes a lot of choices. So by showing different portraits and different styles of portraits, we can show how an artist makes choices that affect how we interpret that person's portrait. So yes, to answer the question, absolutely. We do a lot of comparing and contrasting portraits. Wonderful, thank you so much, Beth. I see we have another question here about the word portraiture. Is portraiture a word? Um, Beth or Irina, would you like to take this one? I can take it too. Um, so portraiture is a world that's talking about, um, it's a word that you can use to refer to portraits as well. Um, so thank you for your question, Dale. Um, some of the other resources that we have, I wanted to share before we go though, of course the audience, if you have any other questions about using, um, you know, portraits, any of the techniques that we've talked about here, please feel free to add them in the chat. But um, one of the other links that Philippa shared earlier was this link to the Eventbrite page for the National Portrait Gallery, where you can find upcoming uh, Young Portrait Explorer sessions and other distance learning opportunities that they're facilitating. Uh, you'll so, so you'll find the entire uh, schedule of upcoming opportunities here. I believe the next Young Portrait Explorers is on Wednesday, April 14th with a portrait of Earth, Wind and Fire, which I think will be a wonderful portrait to jump into. Um, and then there's also the Introducing Playlist, which again is linked here in the chat, but this gathers together in a playlist the Introducing series that you also have in the collection, correct? Wonderful. Well, I think that might wrap it up for questions and resources today. Um, Beth or Irina, is there anything else that you'd like to close up with before Philip and I go to kind of the general closing. I, I would just say that one thing that I hope that people uh, can learn from all of this is that portraiture is for all ages, that um, these tips and these tricks can work for all ages, but really we don't want people to think that portraiture is something that is um, specific just to one group of people or that you have to have all the answers to try and teach your kids about art or history that it is a, a great activity for participants of all ages to, to learn about together. Thank you so much, Beth. Um, so let me bring up this final slide. So again, I just wanted to share again that this session will be archived. So if you want to watch it again, maybe you came in late and want to see what happened at the beginning, or if you want to send it to someone else, you can watch it again at the same link that you're watching it at now whether you're joining us on YouTube or Facebook. Um, you, uh, 
this is also part of a series of webinars. Um, we're just about to launch the new schedule on our Help Center of all the sessions that we'll be hosting again in April. So if you'd like to learn more about getting started in the Learning Lab, creating collections, and more, you can do so here at the Help Center. Our next Cultivating Learning session will be with an educator at the National Zoo, who will also be sharing some art making and facilitation techniques to engage learners with STEM activities, diving into habitats, animals, and more. But for now, I just want to thank you all for joining us today for your wonderful observations and questions. It was a pleasure having you all, and I'm looking forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you again, Beth and Irina, for your fantastic activity. It was so helpful hearing your techniques for using these techniques with students to engage with history and art. Thank you, Beth and Irina, and thank you all our wonderful audience in the chat. Thank you so much, everyone. It's been a pleasure. Thanks all for having right. us. Have a good afternoon.